the earmarks and for what should be a um, So, moving plainly, we're delighted tonight to be having such a big person promotion. Um, before I start with the main meeting, I do have a disclaimer. Uh, we're delighted to have two sitting judges participating in this discussion this evening, but with that privilege comes an important disclaimer. A crucial skill shared by, shared by debaters and lawyers is the ability to argue positions that do not necessarily reflect one's personal views. While judges Kaplan and McMahon will argue against the resolution tonight, they will do so, so they will do so solely in the spirit of debate. Nothing they say should be taken as reflecting their personal views, especially with respect to any issues or facts that may come before them in their judicial roles. So now that we've made this disclaimer, um, I'd like to be starting. So Opening the case for the proposition, we have Commissioner Roger Perino. Roger Perino is the commis Commissioner of the New York State Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services, having served with the New York Police Department for over 20 years. Commissioner Perino, you may take the floor. Do you want me to stand behind that? If you would, if you would okay. And I'm going to tilt this so that's why my opponents come up and speak. They'll remember the award my teammate just got. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. And a little disclaimer, I'm the former commissioner. And uh, what I say is, is my own thoughts and does not represent who I work for. So, and I also have no intention of endorsing or criticizing any president or former president or prime minister or former prime minister. But what I've been sharing is clearly my thoughts on the issue. Over the years, I've worked with many foreign governments on the issues of counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, the UK, Italy, Israel, China, Jordan, Iraq, and Afghanistan. As a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, I wanted to approach tonight with a global perspective. But the more research I did and the more I prepared, I thought it would be better to provide you an eyewitness account of 40 years of terrorism in New York City. I first started when I was your age. I started college, university in 1979, and I took a course on terrorism, sociology of terrorism. And it was very different than what we see today. At the time, we learned about the Red Army faction of West Germany, Black September group that was responsible for killing, uh, murdering, Israeli Olympic athletes at the 72 Olympics. The Japanese Red Army, which was designed to overthrow the Japanese monarchy, but was used by the PLO to attack an airport in Tel Aviv. And of course, the IRA, or the Irish Republican Army, from Northern Ireland in their struggles for home rule with religious overtones. And I also learned the definition of terrorism at the time, which there really truly is no standard definition of terrorist. And for, and for this purposes, it's a non-state actor using violence for social or political change. The root cause of that social or political change that they seek is not what makes the terrorist, it's the violence that makes them the terrorist. They're, the terror groups will represent the right, the left, religious and national causes. No matter what your belief is, somewhere along the line there's a terrorist group that's plotting to the extreme end of your thought process. And it also remains a fact that the, the social and political change many times has a legit cause. It's the violence that's the problem, no matter what, no matter what that cause is. Inter uh, international terrorist organizations conducting violent operations in the U.S. and the U.S. abroad. The IRA, they weren't doing it in the United States in, in the 70s and 80s. The IRA, for example, claimed that most of their fundraising was done in New York City and Boston. And in fact, in the 70s and 80s and the 90s, the U.S. experienced very few acts of international terrorism within our own border. 1982, I joined the police department after a short stint with the Marine Corps. The history of New York City was bombings by anarchists going back 70 or 80 years. And then again in the 70s and 80s, you had the Jewish Defense League, the Black Panthers, the FALN, 
and the weather on the ground combined all domestic terrorist groups over 150 bombings in the United States in the 70s. I joined the police department. I go to the Lower East Side, the first precinct. Thoughting, un, try not thinking that I understand terrorism from what I learned in college, and now it's all thrown off. The moment I walk into the precinct, there's a monument, to, a, a memorial to two police officers that were killed by the BLA. The Weather Underground had a headquarters in the precinct I worked, and in my first New Year's Eve, the FALN bombed New York City with three to four bombs in police headquarters and federal buildings in both Brooklyn and Manhattan. From 93 to 97, New York City experienced uh, the World Trade Center car bomb, which some of you may be familiar with. The Brooklyn Bridge shooting, which was done by uh, an anti-Semite. And the Empire State Building shooting, which was done by a uh, anti-Zionist. And all these cases were clearly criminal investigations handled by law enforcement with the help of the intelligence community. And then on September 11th, that all changed. Prior to September 11th, these cases were handled with the NYPD, FBI, other federal agencies with minor intelligence community involvement. And then September 11th, and I think it's important because of the age of the crowd to explain exactly what happened on September 11th. Four planes were hijacked. Four passenger aircrafts were hijacked. By 19 hijackers from a group, a terrorist group called Al-Qaeda. Those planes were all East Coast planes bound for the West Coast. Two planes were diverted and crashed into the, to the World Trade Center, the towers one and two of the World Trade Center. Within an hour and 42 minutes of those planes hitting the World Trade Center, those buildings came down. Another plane went to the Pentagon, which is the head of our defense department, and a fourth plane crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, after the passengers overtook the, the hostage, the, uh, the terrorists, the, the hijackers. We believe that plane was scheduled to go to uh, the White House. Nine Eleven is the single deadliest terrorist attack in human history and the single deadliest incident for firefighters and law enforcement officers in the history of the United States. 343 firefighters were murdered and 72 cops were murdered. And those first responders are still dying today from 9-11 related diseases. The, the over 100 NYPD cops have died from related diseases from that day. My own experience in 9-11, I was off duty dropping my seven and nine year old sons off for school. Both those boys right now. I apologize. Both those boys right now are officers in the Marine Corps and have deployed both to New Zealand and Afghanistan. I responded off duty. My biggest memory is the hearing the, pl the second plane hit the building. The only other memory I have of noise was the bodies jumping out of the building and when they hit the deck. During the stress of that incident while I was down there, my other senses of hearing were shut off. When the first building collapsed, I was trapped in a building across the street. I finally make my way out. The second building collapsed, I get covered in debris and dust from that building. And quite frankly, I remember being much more of a victim than I remember being a hero that day. About 3,000 people died, about 6,000 were injured. And what's important for this audience to remember is 550 of those dead were not born in the United States. This was an international incident, an act of war. The law enforcement, intelligence, community, and military failed to communicate with each other the potential threats. We concluded that the 9-11 the, the Commission got together and concluded that the war on terror needed 
all elements of a national power, public diplomacy, economic policy, and foreign aid. A more holistic approach of fighting international terrorists was needed as part of the government, and it did not just include law enforcement, the intelligence community, and the military. This was clearly an act of war that we could not look at law enforcement to solve the problem. To prevent this from happening again, we, needed, we need to make changes and prepare for an asymmetrical war. America needed to learn what the UK and Israel, who have been in this fight longer, knew, and we needed to learn from them. Policies were necessary to understand the address and the hatred of the West, and more controversial, violence had to be met with a type of controlled violence as an act of civil def uh, defense. Self-defense, I'm sorry. Military intervention was needed to remove terrorists from across international borders. When I say this, I'm talking about self-defense. I'm not talking about revenge or retribution, although it may have appeared that way. But what we needed to do is we need to remove terrorists before their next move. To, when we get information, we need, to, we need to act on it quickly. These revelations prompted me my personal commitment to do more. From 2007 to 14, I did five deployments overseas in Iraq and Afghanistan. In Iraq against Al-Qaeda and its affiliates, in Afghanistan against the Taliban. And it was there to prop up their government, to help them survive. So quite frankly, I was fighting an insurgency and helping them fight the insurgency. And as we, as academically, it's pretty well confirmed that the majority of all your terrorist organizations start as a local insurgency. So it's very important for us to keep an eye on that. So, is the proposition of the terror and war, has the war on terror made the world safer? I say yes. I hope I gave you a good historic perspective of New York and America. I hope my teammate Ian Smith will address the difficulties of engaging in the war on terror. And I hope my friend and mentor, Secretary Johnson, will explain to you why it's necessary to wage war in order to get peace. Perino for your heartfelt remarks. Um, we will now move to speaker one on the opposition, Judge Lewis A. Kaplan. Lewis Kaplan is a senior United States District Judge of the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. Um, judge Kaplan, you may take the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight and to address this fascinating and important subject. I think in addressing the question before the House, we have to consider um, my opponent's arguments, namely that we are safer today because of the war on terrorism that Commissioner Perino refers to and that has actually been fought for the last 17 years. Let me draw your attention to just a few of the terrorist attacks that have been carried out, coordinated or inspired by terrorist organizations in just the last five years. You'll know every name that I mention. Charlie Hebdo, 2015. The Bataclan Theater Massacre, 2015 the Brussels suicide bombings, 2016, the Nice truck attack, 2016, the Berlin Christmas markets attacks, 2016, the Westminster Bridge attack, 2017, the Manchester Arena suicide bombings, 2017, and just this year, uh, the Easter attacks in Sri Lanka. Since 9-11, when you look at the whole universe 
of successful terror attacks around the world, there have been thousands of casualties. These data show that the lives and limbs of innocents are at risk as they go about their business, as they go to their hotels, <coughs> as they ride public transport, as they sit in theaters and go to their offices. I submit to you that those risks are at least as, at least as great as they were before 9-11. I submit that they are at least as great uh, by reason of the war of terrorism than they otherwise would have been, notwithstanding substantial and notable and laudable successes that the war on terrorism has had, not least of, the, excuse me, not least of them being uh, getting uh, bin Laden in Abbottabad and the recent uh, events involving ISIS's former leader, al-Baghdadi. That is so despite torrents of blood that have been shed on all sides, trillions of dollars spent by our government, yours and others, and it is so in part because the war on terrorism has contributed to the peril despite the successes that it has had. So the answer to the question before the House I submit to you is no, the war on terrorism has not made us safer either than we were before 9-11 or than we would have been otherwise. And the reasons I submit are perfectly plain. Number one, Consider the human toll of the war on terrorism. Just looking at Afghanistan and Iraq, let's put aside Syria for a minute and some of the other venues. Over 400,000 people have died in Afghanistan and Iraq, more than half of them civilians. Over 200,000 civilians killed in those two countries in the war on terrorism countless people injured, over eight million people displaced in those two countries alone. This loss of civilian life, these maimed civilian bodies, these people forced out of their homes, in other words, the collateral damage of the war on terrorism, has filled what I think of as a reservoir, a reservoir of hate, and of a passion for vengeance. It is a reservoir that waters the fields where terrorists are born. And we are reaping and stand to reap in the future a bumper crop. This collateral damage has had at least three effects. First of all, it motivates young people to join terrorist organizations. Secondly, it inspires other people to carry out do-it-yourself terrorist attacks. Just think about the Boston Massacre bombing. These two people, one of whom survived, learned how to make bombs to bomb the Boston Massacre from an Al-Qaeda website. They weren't part of Al-Qaeda, but that's where it came from. The war on terrorism displacement of innocent civilians has contributed and I say only in part, because there are many other causes, more important causes, but it has contributed to the flow of refugees in Europe. That flow of refugees in Europe has led to increased Islamophobia. It has promoted anti-Muslim bigotry. And although not in Europe, at least not that I can point to, it has provoked terrorist attacks not on Westerners and Western sites, but on Muslims, and all you have to do is think of the Al-Nur terrorism attack uh, in New Zealand. So all of these effects of civilian casualties, civilian displacement, they support terrorist recruitment and they inspire terrorist acts. Reason number two, the war on terrorism is not the only contributor to that reservoir I talked about because the war on terrorism has not been waged only by brilliant military and intelligence operations, such as the one that succeeded in getting bin Laden and Baghdadi. It has also unfortunately involved Abu Ghraib, Camp Bucca, and others like it, and the orange-suited inmates of Guantanamo. 
You all know what I'm talking about when I talk about Abu Ghraib. Everybody has seen the photographs of what happened in that prison. Um, they are horrifying. And that's not just my view, that's what the US government report said. And it, I want to be clear, I'm not saying that what happened in Abu Ghraib was US government policy, it was not, but it happened. And it's a fact of life. And US General David Petraeus said this about Abu Ghraib. He said, Abu Ghraib and other situations like it are non-biodegradable. They never go away. The enemy continues to beat you with them like a stick. So Abu Ghraib has played a part in filling that reservoir with the water that, fell, that, that irrigates uh, the places where terrorists grow. I mentioned Camp Bukha. You well may ask, what was Camp Bukha? It was a prison in Iraq operated by the US military until 2009. Its most famous inmate was al-Baghdadi. All sorts of things went on in that prison. The Washington Post and The Guardian both have reported that many senior ISIS leaders first met, schemed, and radicalized others in Camp Bukha. The Guardian has quoted one former inmate as calling Camp Bukha the, quote, perfect environment to learn and scheme. Another inmate told Al Jazeera that courses were conducted using blackboards or whiteboards in the prison in how to make bombs and plan terrorist attacks. Camp Bukha has been called by many journalists the Jihadi University. And notwithstanding um, the death of al-Baghdadi, the alumni of that university remain, many of them, serious dangers today and will as long as they are active. I mentioned also Guantanamo. My friend Secretary Johnson had the task of closing Guantanamo and he did everything that was humanly possible to do it. It proved impossible. Guantanamo remains today a part of the extremist playbook. The orange-suited Guantanamo de detainees, you've seen the films, Bin Laden used them in video recruiting. Their use by ISIS in recruiting was notorious. They used those videos to recruit and inspire by pointing to Guantanamo's alleged mistreatment of the inmates. In fact, President Trump really confirmed that, I think perhaps inadvertently, only last week, when he said that ISIS uses the internet better than almost anybody in the world, perhaps other than Donald Trump. <laughs> well, well, he got that half right. <laughs> the third reason, and I'll, I'll try to be quick because I want to respect everyone's time, is quite simply this. There's a military term, I'm sure Ian will tell us about it, called mission creep. It means you send the military in to do a job and somehow the job grows beyond what anyone conceived of. The mission at the beginning of the war on terrorism was to hit Afghanistan and deprive Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden of the safe haven that they had enjoyed and from which they launched the 9-11 attack. Well, you all know what happened. The mission grew and it took on the invasion of Iraq and here we've been 17 years later and in considering the arguments in favor of the resolution let me just say that the one thing no one ever should underestimate is the fervor on the terrorist side. I've watched it in my own courtroom trying senior Al-Qaeda members and officials. I watched it, or I watched in one trial, an Al-Qaeda home movie that was literally that. It was never intended to see Western eyes. It was Bin Laden and a crowd of his confidence sitting on the floor in a room talking about the World Trade Center attack. And the unforgettable, the memorable part was Bin Laden sort of shooing away some of the comments others made and said, no, no, it was me. 
It was I who knew from my background that flying jets loaded with jet fuel into that building would produce an explosion with temperatures sufficient to melt the structural steel, the implication being, and to bring it all down on those 3,000 people. Never forget that is what we are dealing with. Never forget that these uh, uh, jihadists are committed to waging terror without end, without regard to personal consequences, while they're only a small part of the Islamic world and most do not sympathize with them. That fanaticism makes it naive, in my judgment, to think that we're now any safer or any closer to the end of the war on terror than we were when President Bush, in 2013, declared from the deck of a United States aircraft carrier, mission accomplished. I ask the House to vote no. Thank you, Judge Kaplan. We will now open the debate to a round of floor speeches. So the Cambridge Union Society was founded in 1815 to allow students to listen to, but most importantly, challenge the speakers who shape our world. Um, just to recap, in a debate, you can do this in two ways. The first is a point of information. If you want to intervene in a speaker's speech, do you just stand up and say on that point or point of information? They can either accept or deny your point. Um, and please don't start making your point until the microphone comes to you. Well, we're now opening the debate for our floor speeches. Um, between sets of speeches, I call for a set of floor speeches. Um, I will pick one person to make a speech in proposition, one person to make a speech in opposition, and one person to make a speech in abstention. If you are picked, please bring your membership card to the dispatch box and speak from one of these mics. Uh, we highly encourage people who have not done so before to try it out. It's really not as scary as it looks. Um, and also, we have two floor speech prizes, the first prize being a gift voucher for yes, Satyam Yoga, and the run up being personal training session with Tony Begovich. So, you know, if that's not an incentive, then what is? Um, right, so would anyone like to make a speech in proposition of the motion? Would anyone like to make a speech in proposition of the motion? Would anyone like to make a speech in opposition of the motion? Should we go for there? So I'm just going to make a very brief point. Uh, tonight's debate is, is the world a safer place? I'd say the world includes the Middle East where the gentleman said 400,000 have died. I've seen conservative estimates at 1.3 million as a minimum. I would argue the debate hasn't been where the actions right or wrong. Most of us would argue would, would agree they were right. But is the world safer? And that world must include those in the Middle East who have suffered. Would anyone like to make a speech in abstention of the motion? You should go for there. Can you please remember to bring your membership card or state your name in college, please? Okay, this is indeed working. I'd like to start this uh, proposition by paying tribute to those people in Mozambique, Syria, and Afghanistan that have died recently at the hands of the Islamic State, the Taliban, and Al-Qaeda. I would also like to pay tribute to the servicemen, women of the United States, Britain, France, the rest of Europe, and of course our friends in Kurdistan and the Middle East in the fight of this struggle that one day people would live free of being killed, 
harassed or oppressed for their religious belief or their right of birth or anything else. I say to abstain on this motion because this war is not over by any means certain. When this war begun, I want to make clear that there have been great headways. The Afghani Taliban had a state with a seat in the UN of which they were able to preach their villatrolic, fascistic, Islamist rhetoric and to hold an entire population of peoples oppressed under them. Of course, this is which, supported by the late and dead, thankfully, criminal Osama bin Laden. Not to mention of this, after the fall of Saddam Hussein, which I will defend to the death as one of the best decisions of the 21st century, if anyone wants to challenge me of it, say it now or wait for afterwards. That we have successfully, and I say successfully, taken down a network run by senior bin Ladenists and this new and the aftermath of this of a neo barfist and dare I say neo Nazi dictatorship in the Middle East. But it's, with that gone and passed, this, the front of this war has changed. Iran at present holds a monopoly over terror in the Middle East. Hamas has not been uprooted from power and they continue their thankfully empty campaign against my people and half of my family, the state of Israel. And Hezbollah still holds a threshold over one of the most diverse and one of say one country I've come to love, Lebanon. And because of this, I say, just because the fronts have changed, just because there are bodies piling up, as, as upsetting it may be to see it, does not mean we should ever give up. But it doesn't mean that we can win or lose. You would, I would have never said this to a British soldier in 1942 when the Wehrmacht did SS and Hitler held, held a monopoly and control over Europe because within a few months that, of course, changed. And I'm not to say that in a few months... The, networks can be dismantled. As far as we're concerned, the black flag could be raised over, raised over us. But we cannot, we cannot speculate on the totally unpredictable. And because of this, I say abstain on the motion, because if you were to vote either side, you could be easily proven wrong. And to do so would to dismiss and, dare I say, put away the efforts of, of civil servants, law enforcement officials like the good commissioner here, in this great fight. Thank you. Thank you for your speech. We will now be moving to the second speaker on side proposition. The second speaker is Ian Smith. What do we mean by safety? And who and where do we mean by it? Is it the absence of imme immediate physical violence or is there more to it than the black and white binaries the discourse would have us believe? Firstly, I would like to point out that the shorthand 9-11 makes a spatial context of events in favor of temporal indication, which seeks, sorry, which seeks to privilege the date in favor of American pain. In terms of physical safety, the multiple wars that have raged since President Bush's war, continued by President Obama and now by the incumbent US president, places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and Yemen have become decidedly less safe, as mentioned by my fellow members of the opposition. According to a UN report from October of this year, Afghanistan has seen record high levels of civilian casualties in the third quarter of 2019. The war on terror's new and more recent manifestation in the form of the drone war has been described by John Brennan in 2013 as a more efficient way of distinguishing between an Al-Qaeda terrorist and innocent civilians. As well as the presumption in this that the drone war is a more effective way of killing, the asymmetrical nature of the drone war itself already suggests that one form of life, the Western, is more valuable than another. Civilians killed have been labelled again and again as collateral damage, even today, even this evening. Words like collateral damage serve to mask the very real bloodshed of this war and dehumanise the people who are suffering and killed. But beyond physical safety, the psychological safety of these people targeted by this rebranding of the war on terror should not go unnoticed. The panoptical eye of the drone has a psychological impact on the populations it observes and significant power over the bodies that it controls as a result. 
There are countless accounts of how local populations are constantly on edge and suffering from trauma as a result of the incessant fears of a strike, compellingly recorded in a Stanford report from 2012. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, good evening. So both you and Judge Kaplan mentioned the number of lives that uh, were killed due to collateral damage. What about the lives that were actually saved by the war on terror? The numbers that we don't see, the behind the scenes of the war on terror? There are behind the scenes of the war on terror. Thank you for your question. But I will get to that. Is that okay in my following points? I think what I'm trying to say is that as well as the behind the scenes effects and as well as all, everything that we do and don't see that we may or may not take for granted, as Ian mentioned, in terms of language, the danger that's generated by the narrative of the war on terror is deeply insidious. The language and securitization of terror has an important political currency and it has seeped into the culture of today and is ultimately responsible for the everyday Islamophobia and racism that we're witnessing on a global scale. This language of securitization has been used in order to justify political ends from the Iraq war to the persecution of Uyghurs in China and the Rohingyas in Burma, and this is the legacy of the war on terror. The knowledge production that has resulted from the event-driven and hyper-mediatized research has made the world a significantly less safe space. People who travel or just exist in their daily lives are targeted and abused, fac facing anything from microaggressions to outright racism. Is the world a safer place for them? The travel ban, or what I'm sure we all understand as a sanitized term for a Muslim ban, by the incumbent president of the United States, has reinforced the problematic conflation that Muslims from anywhere could be terrorists or dangerous, with serious consequences to their safety. This blame game that one party or specific civilization, for want of a better word, is responsible for conflict is simplistic and ahistorical. The Iraq war and other forms of violence originating in the West, including the most important triggers for the sociogenesis of IS, which are Abu Ghraib and the hanging of Saddam Hussein, are missing from Western mainstream public memory today. No, thank you. Finally, I would argue that the world is not a safer place for us here in the West. The forces that have been involved in this war on terrorism have created a relationship with terrorism that is constitutive of it. This is the concept of the colonial boomerang, and we see this in the violence occurring in the Western metropolis, including those by the Qureshi brothers in Paris in 2015 and others. Western states are becoming increasingly authoritarian towards their populations in the name of opposing the new terrorist threat. There has been a circulation of violence. Afghanistan in 1979 led to Al-Qaeda, and Iraq in 2003 led to IS, and this led to the homegrown, do-it-yourself Western terrorist. The war on terror is failing. The violence has been repackaged and returned to the sender, and the colonial boomerang has been received. The success of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan is often justified by the fleeting feeling of success for the demise of Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. But I want to ask you, is this trade-off worth it? Are the deaths of countless civilians at the hands of coalition forces what constitutes safety? Does safety mean stopping terrorism attacks, as you mentioned? And if so, does stopping terror attacks constitute making the world a safer place? And is that really good enough? Because I don't think that it is. After 9-11, the United States launched a process of renewed imperialism under the guise of the global war on terror, which has come back to haunt it and endanger it and a large segment of the West along with it. The fact that this motion is based on a discussion as a matter of safety for everybody is a testament to the strength of the insidious legacy reinforced by the binary nar narratives of the global war on terror. In my opinion, this is a matter of structural violence. I've demonstrated that the, world on terror, the war on terror has made the world significantly more dangerous for certain people. How anyone could then argue that it has made the world safer for anyone, or even a select few, would be a testament to the strength of the structural and epistemic violence that permeates our society and allows for discrimination based on a system of othering. I would implore the audience to be mindful of dangerous binaries evoking the language of the simplistic and orientalist languages of the Clash of Civilizations thesis that has dominated policy. I therefore require the House to vote no. Thank you. We will now be moving to our second round of floor speeches. Just a reminder that the Cambridge Union Society obviously encourages students to challenge speakers, but please do so in a respectful manner. 
Um, so, should we start with floor speeches in proposition of the motion? Yes. Um, could you come down by any chance? <laughs> or actually, yeah. Um, since um, Alicia can't see your membership card, do you mind stating your name in college, please, for the, for the notes? Yeah, um, Anatoly Grableski, Queens College. Um, I'd like to make a point regarding the framing of the motion. What has been neglected in this debate so far is the alternative to the motion that we are debating tonight. Um, there's no doubt that the war on terror, as has been, as, as has been stated by the, by the opposition, has been brutal and horrifying, and, and there is, and in a way, it seems unjustifiable. But I would like to ask you this. Would the world have been better off if the war on terror had not been declared? Now let me bring you three cases to illustrate this. First, would the world have been better off if we allowed Al-Qaeda and the Taliban to continue to oppress an entire country and use it as a base for its evil operations? Yes, the war on terror has not eliminated Al-Qaeda and, and its affiliates in Afghanistan, but it has dramatically weakened them. Second, would the world have been better off if we allowed Saddam Hussein to continue gassing his own people and committing acts of genocide against the Kurds? The speaker, the second speaker for the, op for the opposition has mentioned that the issue of safety. And indeed, safety for whom? Should we not consider the plight of the Kurds? Should we not consider the plight of the Eastern Christians and Jews living under, under Saddam Hussein, under Iran today? Should we not consider even a little girl called Malala, all of whom you know, and who, was a, who all we know was oppressed by the same system that we are trying to fight in the war of terror? Finally and thirdly, who among you will claim that the war against ISIS has not been justified? Who among you will deny that almost the entirety of perhaps the most evil state of the 21st century has been destroyed purely by means of the war on terror? Or should we have not done anything as the mur murderous ISIS was burning people in cages and expanding its tentacles across the Middle East? Therefore, I would like to answer the second speaker. Was it, was it worth fighting ISIS? Yes, I believe it was. Is there anyone who'd like to make a speech in opposition of the motion? Okay, up there. Daniel McKinnon, Queen's College. Um, I think a lot, of the, a lot of the points made have been about whether there's been more terrorist attacks or whether, whether more people have died with, uh, with or without the war on terror. But that's not all of what safety is. It's not just mortal safety, it's about general safety. I'm half caste and I haven't gone through an airport without being randomly checked since I was 12. I think people of, people of color, especially in the West, have seen that the terrorists won. People are terrified. And the Patriot Act in the US and the anti-terror laws here have just allowed the, the government to increase their control um, and increase the prejudice against people who look like me. And I think a lot of people who look like me will say the war on terror has made, the, has, made it, has made the world for us a lot less safe because now when we walk down the street and people are giving us looks as if we want to kill them, it makes us feel a lot less safe because then they think they want to kill me, I, want to, I should do something first. And it's, it, it, makes, it makes the world a lot more dangerous if you're not white. Thanks. Is there anyone who'd like to make a speech in abstention of the motion? Um, shall we go for there? Andrew Oswald of Homerton College. Um, okay, so a few things. I think it's very difficult, like the first, uh, sorry, like the floor speech speaker in proposition said, it's very difficult to argue that the war on terror has not made the world safer in some cases. I think, yeah, it's justified to go in and kill Osama bin Laden, but then you have several structural issues. Um, number one, when you justify intervening in states um, for various things, you can start to extend that. 
and you can start to extend it to a point where you can justify a lot of things, and that's why you can get invasions like Iraq and lots of other lots of fun stuff. And then you can use that to benefit your own state by getting oil. And then, also, I don't like this motion. This motion is bad for several reasons. It doesn't properly address where the issue of the war of terror comes from. And why is that? The war of terror comes from not the fact that 9-11 happened. It happened because there were other terrorist attacks as well, like the second speaker in Proposition said, but why did those things happen? Why do human beings hurt each other? Human beings hurt e each other because they are hurt first by somebody else. America was intervening in the Middle East for decades beyond 9-11, before 9-11. We had America funding and specifically overthrowing the Iranian government, funding a war between both sides of Iraq and Iran, giving poisonous gas and weapons of mass destruction to Saddam Hussein, who then used it against his own people. This is all documented by the Council of Foreign Relations, and it's been released, but people keep ignoring it. This has been going on for years. It's not just the fact that it just happened. America has been intervening and causing chaos in that world for a long time. And we can see that this happened because one of the things that happened after the intervening in the Iranian government is that incumbent government then made a great oil contract with them. And this continued with the Iraqi government that was then installed. There are interests here. And as soon as you confuse human rights and you add your own interests to it, then the morality of your intervention is tainted. And you, you can't do that. This debate is flawed because it does not address the issue of why the war of terror happened. Yes, it does make the world safer. It makes the world more dangerous. I mean, I don't know. It kind of does both in a way. But why does it happen? It happens because someone else was hurt first. Thank you. Before we move to our last round of speeches, given there is no first speech in proposition, I'm going to be taking one more speech on side abstention. Um, is there anyone who'd like to make a speech in abstention of the motion? <laughs> Go on. Thanks, Rachel. Um, Charles Connor, King's College. Um, I was sort of in the middle to start with in this debate, and actually the second speech on side proposition sort of swung me a little bit. Um, but actually the speech room up there pulled me back into the middle. Uh, <laughs> so sorry. Uh, <laughs> because I think lots of what we've been debating here essentially comes down to a counterfactual question, right? What if the war on terror didn't actually happen? Well, what, what, what if it didn't happen? And we start getting into very, very difficult calculations, all right? So if after 9-11, the US and Britain didn't go into the Middle East, what would the implications have been? The implications for the West, the implications for the Middle East, right? We've heard about some of the implications of that intervention, which actually happened, and I'm not doubting that at all in terms of microaggressions, uh, to people uh, from the BME community, absolutely. I just find it very, very difficult in my own head to weigh up, no, no, weigh up to balance these things and to balance all these awful, awful implications which have come both as a consequence of the war on terror, I'm not doubting that at all, but the consequences which may have happened if the war on terror hadn't happened in the first place. So for me, at least as an ex-historian, this is a counterfactual question which I'm struggling with, and I'm hoping that the two final speakers, both from the proposition and the opposition, can help me out with it, because I'm still stuck in the middle. Thank you very much. We will now move to our last round of speakers. So closing this case for the proposition, Secretary Jay Johnson. Secretary Johnson served in President Obama's cabinet as Secretary of Homeland Security from 2013 to 2017. He served as General Counsel for the Air Force under President Clinton and as Special Counsel to Secretary John Kerry's presidential campaign. He was the designated survivor during President Trump's inauguration. Pre Secretary Johnson, you may take the floor. Am I on? Can you hear me? 
Yes? Is it this or is it this? It's this. Okay. So, um, Madam President, um, distinguished debate participants, members of this union, students, Charles, let me see if I can pull you back over the line. Um, we heard this evening a very self-effacing first-hand account of the events in New York City on September 11, 2001 from my debate partner, Roger Perino. As I think he relayed to you, Lieutenant Perino of the New York City Police Department on that day recognized this was not just a crime that had been committed. This was an act of war. America was under attack. Indeed, much of the world was under attack on September 11, 2001. To do nothing in the face of such an attack after 2,977 people died was not an option. And sometimes, as my former boss, Barack Obama, said, we love peace. But sometimes, to secure peace, you have to wage war. On the proposition, has the war on terror, lowercase w, lowercase t, not the Bush era war on terror, but has armed conflict, military action, made the world a safer place? The answer has to be yes, a safer place. This is, this, is a, this is a net net proposition. Are we safe? Of course not. We're not safe. We still face the threat of terrorist organizations, terrorist attacks day by day. After 9-11, we saw Madrid, 2004. We saw 7-7, 2005. The London subways. Paris, November 13, 2015. Mogadishu, Sri Lanka, and numerous other places. No, thank you. I'm on a roll. <laughs> Terrorism is not defeated. It's not over. But the response has been and has to be a comprehensive response with military action as the centerpiece for it. What is the evidence that as a result of our military action so far, the world is a safer place for terrorism, safer? As a result of military force, Osama bin Laden is dead. As a result of military force, Anwar al-Awlaki, the most visible member, the operational leader of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, is dead, killed in 2011. Ahmed Gaddami, leader of Al-Shabaab, killed in 2014. Mohammed Amwazi, Jihadi John, the so-called Beatle, who brutally murdered David Haynes, Alan Hemming, James Foley, is dead. Abu Nabil the leader of the Islamic State in Syria. Ibrahim al-Assiri, regarded by many terrorism experts as the single most dangerous terrorist on earth, the bomb maker, who was on the road to building a non-metallic bomb. According to Wikipedia, this is why you students should not rely on Wikipedia, we killed him four times. We killed him four times, but as of 2017, he is regarded by most experts to be dead. And of course, within the last three weeks, Abu Bakr Baghdadi, the leader of the Islamic State, with a partnership with Syrian Democratic Forces, we have taken out 28,000, killed 28,000 members of the Islamic State and captured over 11,000. We have reduced the so-called caliphate in Iraq and Syria, which used to be the size of this island, down 
to almost nothing. Someone up here asked, instead of asking about the lives lost, what about the lives saved? Ask yourself, what if things had continued unabated? What if the caliphate had been allowed to continue to grow unabated? Leaving terrorist organizations alone, looking the other way, does not give you immunity. History shows that. A caliphate grows in strength if unabated. With territory comes power, the ability to train, hide, recruit, harvest, finance, and launch large-scale terrorist attacks. At one point, according to experts, the Islamic State controlled 60% of Syria's oil protection, taxed businesses, Christian communities within their so-called caliphate, which netted them millions, obtained millions through the sale of antiquities, ransom payments, seized passport production facilities, according to open source reporting, seized a chemical weapons facility, a chemical weapons facility of the Iraqi government, and reportedly seized natural uranium from Mosul in Iraq. Al-Asiri, as I mentioned a moment ago, the bomb maker was on a path to build a non-metallic bomb. And the victims of these terrorist organizations are not just the West. The principal victims of these terrorist organizations, frankly, are people who look like me, people of color. You all know that if they had been allowed to continue unabated, many, many lives would have been lost. As a result of military action to date, we are safer by all accounts. As a result of actions taken to date, it is no longer the case, as most experts would say, that Al-Qaeda is able to launch a large-scale strategic attack here in the West. By all accounts, the ability of both Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State to launch a large-scale attack has been degraded. We are safer, but we are not safe. We are not safe yet by any means. Terrorism is not over. We live today with the threat of what we refer to as terrorist-inspired attacks, smaller-scale, random, terrorist-inspired attacks. In the end, the ultimate anecdote is not a drone strike or an army. The aim of a terrorist organization is to terrorize, to make white fear brown, to make brown fear black, to make Christians fear Muslims, to make Muslims fear Jews, to make Americans fear Americans, to make British fear British, to make the native fear the immigrant. This is the goal of a terrorist organization, to make us turn inward, to make us exit international organizations, to make us afraid of each other, to create fear where there should be none, as a result of which we launched the Iraq War, which was, I think most of us here would concede, one of the greatest national security miscalculations of our lifetime. Yes, miscalculation. I see you shaking your head. Terrorism cannot prevail if we refuse to be terrorized. All of us want a world, not just you young people, all of us want a world in which there are no more magnetometers, in which there are no more cement barricades in front of government buildings. In my lifetime, I could go to an airport and not be searched. I could park a car in a public parking lot steps away from the U.S. Capitol. But those of us in national security have to be realist in the protection of the public. And so our efforts must go on 
but we must acknowledge the bravery, the courage, and the expertise of those who have brought us to this point so far. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary Johnson, for your speech. This brings us to our last speaker, who is closing the case for side opposition, Judge Colleen McMahon. The judge is the Chief United States District Judge of the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. Colleen, please take the floor. Madam President and members of this honorable house, I have a slightly different take on this subject. The rule of law is the beating heart of the Anglo-American experiment. The rule of law is the greatest gift of your nation to mine. And so it is with the most profound sorrow that I submit to this house that the war on terror has made us less safe by claiming as collateral damage the rule of law. Let me offer just a few examples. We have laws in your country and mine to protect our privacy, described by the great Justice Louis Brandeis as the right most valued by a free people. And yet for years after 9-11, the citizens of my country were subjected to the secret monitoring of data about our international communications and dealings, almost none of which had anything to do with terrorism. And while some excesses were curtailed when this program's existence came to light, it remains the case today that our governments can see to whom we speak where we are and what we read, and that as long as they collect this data, this deeply personal information in bulk, rather than targeting us individually, they need not follow the ancient practice of obtaining a warrant on probable cause from a neutral magistrate. We have laws in your country and mine to protect our homes from invasion and our persons from excessive force at the hands of government agents, but over the past two decades, battlefield gear given to local police to enlist their help in the war on terrorism has been used instead to raid premises where the offenses being committed were as trivial as betting on football games or running unlicensed barber shops. Assault rifles, Battering rams and flash grenades used for these purposes resulted in injury and in a few unhappy cases, death to persons as yet convicted of no crime, let alone capital crime. These warlike raids by so-called peace officers have terrorized communities and undermined public trust in law enforcement to the detriment of public safety. We have laws enshrined in binding treaty obligations that require us to respect the sovereignty of nations. But as pointed out by one of the earlier speakers from the floor, on the excuse of keeping our citizens safe, we have repeatedly inserted ourselves without invitation into sovereign states with which we are not at war in violation of these most sacred undertakings. Having set this dangerous precedent, we should not be surprised if the day arrives when our own sovereignty is disrespected by some nation whose security interests may not be congruent with our own, a development that could lead to the most cataclysmic of consequences. We have laws in your nation and mine against torture, against the type of torture that Judge Kaplan described so eloquently, against the type of torture that Ian said specifically needed to be controlled by commanders who would take no, no, who would tolerate it not a bit. 
Those laws have for two decades gone utterly unenforced, and no single human being has been held accountable for any of the excesses that were committed in the name of the war on terror by out-of-control allied forces. Finally, we have laws against depriving our citizens of life or liberty without affording them due process of law. Yet as part of the war on terror, my government has condemned and killed several American citizens, one of whom was named here by Secretary Johnson, who were found by the executive to be enemy combatants, determinations that took place out of the public eye, without the involvement of any prosecutor or court of law, and pursuant to an ill-defined sort of process that did not include such historic rights as public accusation, representation by counsel, trial by jury, or judicial review. Every one of these endeavors represented an end run around settled principles of Anglo-American jurisprudence. Every one was justified as a measure required for national security. And I will take it as a given that each was a well-intended attempt to reduce or eliminate some perceived terrorist threat. But as we all know, ladies and gentlemen, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And so I ask, have we made ourselves safer by winking at these inconvenient laws, or are we headed straight to a hell of our own making? The answer I submit is clear. We may have prevented a second Twin, twin Towers tie-up of attack, but we remain threatened by non-state actors with visions of jihadist glory who emerge like whack-a-mole from the holes. As the last of them are eliminated, the new ones come up, transforming their resources into dastardly acts of modern piracy. And we, are, and we remain threatened by the online radicalization of the dispossessed and the disaffected who continue to pursue their dreams, no matter how many of them we destroy while enslaving women and girls. And we remain threatened by the destabilization brought about by the dismemberment of the Levant and Africa, the fracturing of our historic alliances and our inexplicable inattention to the implications of our unilateral actions on great power relations. And while chasing this chimera of security, we have diverted precious resources from other and more pressing dangers. We have de deprioritized in favor of counterterrorism the enforcement of laws against financial fraud and cybercrime and public corruption, crimes that are far more likely to disrupt the lives of our citizens than any terrorist attack. And we have downplayed the truly existential threat of climate change, which has already taken a toll in lives and property far exceeding anything perpetrated by terrorists and to which the emissions and environmental damage of the war on terror have been among the greatest contributors. But above all, we have increased the odds that powerful persons, seeing that the rule of law can be skirted with impunity in the face of an understandable but irrational popular hysteria will deem the law dispensable should it prove inconvenient to the achievement of what seems to those persons who may be angels or who may be tyrants of some greater good. I say to this house, there is no greater good than the rule of law as we will learn to our sorrow if we wake up one morning and find ourselves shorn of its protection. Madam President, when he was still a loyal citizen of the crown, 
The great American sage Benjamin Franklin observed those who would give up essential liberty to, pursue, to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Like my colleagues, I do not minimize the dangers posed by international terrorism, nor do I deny the need to be vigilant against it, and I am second to none in my commendation of the bravery of those who fight against it, one of whom included my own son. But there are dangers greater in this life than planes flying into buildings. And we dare not purchase our safety at the price of the very thing that makes us who we are. We are not the first people of the law to stare down terror. Our forebears did not sacrifice their rights or their principles in the face of the blitz or the bomb. So I submit that we need not and must not compromise the supremacy of the law, first enshrined in Magna Carta and echoed in the American Constitution in order to deal with the terrorist threat that we face today. And I say that if we give up the rule of law, that most essential guardian of everything of value to our way of life, in order to purchase what looks in the moment like a little safety, we will deserve what we get, and we will get what we deserve. Against the proposition.